Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ron Sahu. Uh, Ron has done a really interesting study uh, on the subject of clean coal technologies uh, as applied uh, to South Africa uh, and in terms of the integrated resource plan for electricity, South Africa is planning uh, some 1,500 megawatts of new coal-fired power in South Africa in the years to 2030, and has expressed the view uh, that it would prefer clean coal technologies. So the study by uh, Ron uh, into the subject of clean coal technologies has been extremely interesting. And we're here this evening to explore some of the issues that he raised in his, um, in his study. So uh, welcome to you, Ron. And may I uh, pose my first question to you as follows. To what extent could supercritical or ultra supercritical coal-fired steam generation technologies with low NOx burners, fabric filters for particulate emissions, and fluid gas desulfurization plant, but without carbon capture and storage, to what extent could this be considered a clean coal technology for South Africa? Well, thank you for having me, Chris. Uh, you know, uh, I will say that with the following caveat, that there is no actual definition of what a supercritical or ultra supercritical thermal cycle is. And, and that's an important caveat because different vendors present those technologies somewhat differently than others and therefore their emissions and their efficiencies do vary. But as I understand it, to be considered clean coal technology, the government wants a high efficiency, low emissions type of technology mix. And super critical by itself, there are, that technology has been deployed around the world. So I would consider that a candidate, but I would not consider ultra supercritical a candidate per se, due to a variety of reasons, including cost and, and, and really metallurgical challenges. And uh, can I ask you, without um, carbon capture and storage, uh, would uh, supercritical be considered a clean coal technology? I, I would not, for the simple reason that the amount of carbon reduction you get with these technologies is marginal. Uh, you get the more dramatic reductions with carbon capture and storage. So these incremental efficiency increases, which do give you some benefits, are incremental. And, and frankly, they evaporate. <laughs> in practical operations. Uh, you, they might look good on day one and be you know, promising, but as the plant ages, it is very difficult to keep and maintain and realize those efficiencies. And therefore they, in practice, don't turn out to be very beneficial at all. Thanks. Uh, onto my second question, Ron. What is your estimation of the willingness of financial institutions to fund supercritical coal-fired steam generation technologies with low NOx burners, fabric filters, and flue gas desulfurization plant, but without carbon capture and storage in South Africa? That's an interesting question as far as uh, very recent developments, as you know, Chris, especially in, in just even this year, um, Coal finance by international institutions, whether they're public you know, or private, uh, I think there's been a lot of development and general retrenchment, if you will, uh, and, and, and lack of willingness to frankly fund coal-fired power plants, whether they are with or without carbon capture technology. And certainly without carbon capture technology, uh, most of the public sort of export import bank types uh, have generally pledged, you know, G7 meeting in March and, you know, there was G20 meetings in, uh, later on in the year in July, just not too long ago. 
they have all pledged to varying degrees to stop that financing. Uh, private banks, which fund significant amount of coal capacity around the world, even they, the mega banks, if you will, in the Western world and otherwise have taken similar pledges. So I actually see that route of financing drying up pretty quickly. It's, it's, there's a snowball effect and that is becoming more and more difficult to justify coal-fired projects and, and to have them financed by whether private or public agency. Uh, the, China uh, is a little opaque in that regard, but even they are coming around to putting more constraints on that, in my view. Mm. Yeah, and, and, you know, we've seen in South Africa uh, around the Tabametsi and Kanisa uh, coal IPP projects that were planned but have since been abandoned. We've seen uh, private uh, commercial banks uh, in South Africa uh, withdrawing their funding to the extent where these projects have been abandoned. Uh, and I'm just wanting to explore this. To what extent could circulating fluidized bed technologies without carbon capture and storage be considered as a clean coal technology for South Africa? I see that the, the integrated resource plan almost indicated a preference for that technology because of the, frankly, the fuel. I mean, the, the type of flexibility that fluidized bed technologies give you to burn any kind of fuel. Uh, and that might be a better fit for South Africa. But when it comes to the clean coal side, it is a very poor candidate. Uh, there are really good reasons uh, to not consider fluidized bed technologies without carbon capture and storage as frankly not a clean coal technology. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I would agree with that. Uh, and tell me, realistically, what do you think is the potential for carbon capture and storage from this 1,500 megawatt of planned coal-fired power plant in South Africa, considering issues such as cost, uh, geological conditions in South Africa, and other real-world considerations? I, I potential is next to negligible. I, mean, I, I hate to be so definite about that, but considerable amount of effort has gone into doing carbon capture. And that is not new technology. There are different ways in which you can capture the carbon using amine technologies and so on. The question is, at what cost? At what other energy penalty? And that has not proven out anywhere, frankly, uh, projects that were uh, apparently successful, whether in Canada, as I discussed in my report, or in the US, as I discussed in my report, or elsewhere in the world, they simply have not realized those benefits at scale. Mm -hmm. And that is not going to change. I mean, clean coal technology does get some funding um, around the world, but the breakthroughs are always five to 10 years out. <laughs> it's always on the horizon, and there is nothing uh, that is that gives me confidence to say that they will become uh, commercially viable un unless we get into a world where the carbon pricing is significantly greater or is of magnitude greater than today. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, particularly, I saw a presentation by ESCOM with regards to work that they did identifying storage basins and things. If they did capture the carbon, where they would store it. And that doesn't look promising at all. I mean, if you look at the coastal areas or where there may be geologic formation, the cost of pipelines to get the carbon for where they are generated to those are astronomical. So I don't see that working at any level in South Africa, both on the capture side and on the uh, sort of storage side of things. And talking of Eskom, uh, I note that Eskom has been experimenting with underground coal gasification at Majuba power station for years. Is there any sign of this being successfully applied as a clean coal technology in South Africa yet? I don't see it. And this, uh, the presentation, Chris, that I uh, saw, which was literally just months ago in March of 2021, there is a slide on underground coal gasification. And this is an ESCOM presentation. And they talk about the, this coal firing demonstration at unit four at Majuba. 
Uh, and they say that initial coal firing happened back in 2010. And then here's the quote. It says the commercial and financial viability of this technology has not been assessed. This needs to be completed before further funds can be spent on UCG. And, and so even by their own admission, it is not promising uh, and it is languished and for very many good reasons, technical and commercial. So I don't see that as promising. And finally, Ron, uh, do you believe that the DMRE and the Integrated Resource Plan for Electricity, IRP 2019, is actually serious about 1,500 megawatts of new coal-fired power generation in South Africa by 2030? And realistically, what do you personally believe the chances are that this 1,500 megawatts will actually happen in South Africa by 2030? I personally don't think it will happen. Uh, we are, events are moving pretty quick, quickly in the world when it comes to coal. And events, even in the time scale since the IRP was prepared, have changed the landscape. The IRP does state that they want viable, commercial, available technologies before they can consider it. And I just don't see that happening. Uh, I, I was struck that they wanted a portion of that, 750 megawatts by 2023, which simply as an engineering matter, you cannot get from here to there. But even forgetting 2023, if you want to look at 2030 and get all 1500 megawatts, I see that becoming more and more difficult and next to impossible, especially if they really want to stick to their H-E-L-E and, and sort of low carbon targets. Uh, that Getting that technology at cost, at scale and financed, uh, it, it simply does not look personally viable to me. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and that was uh, Dr. Ron Sahu, a, uh, a specialist uh, engineer and uh, a, a researcher uh, with many, many years of experience in the uh, field of power generation, uh, giving his views on the uh, planned 1,500 megawatts of new coal generation capacity uh, as detailed in the Integrated Resource Plan for Electricity 2019, uh, and with particular reference uh, to the preference expressed by the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy for clean coal technology uh, by 2030 for this 1500 megawatts. So thank you very much, Ron, uh, for your time and for the interview, uh, for you signing in from the USA. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you this evening, and I look forward to meeting you again in due course. Good night. Thank you, Chris. Likewise.